I invite you to pray with me, please. Gracious God, I thank you for this day and for the privilege of being gathered in this place with this people around these words today. And as we consider them, God, I pray that the words of my mouth and all of our thoughts and prayers are pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So uh, in a couple of weeks, it will be 17 years since uh, I was ordained and have been preaching pretty much every Sunday since that time. And I've kept a record of every single sermon that I've preached, every baby that I've dedicated, every funeral, wedding that I've presided. I'm sure that most pastors have that. But uh, every sermon is cataloged here, scripture text, date, place, and title. And there's 768 total. So uh, today is number 768. And I can say something after having preached 768 sermons with absolute certainty, though I probably could have said it after about 50 or 100, and that is that some sermons fall flat. They just kind of do. And what, what I've learned is that it's not the ones that I think are going to fall flat. Every, every, every week is the same for the last 17 years. I, I never wait to the last minute, ever, on a sermon, ever. I'm not one of those guys that is up Saturday night writing the sermon. I work a little bit on my sermon every day of the week, usually in the dark or when it's uh, before the office opens up. Just a little bit Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, so a little bit every, all the way throughout the week. And sometimes, sometimes it's super easy, like Monday. Monday, I know exactly what I'm going to say on Sunday. Divine revelation. And it's crystal clear. Uh, the words just pour out on the paper, and it fits in. It's, it's fitting in wonderfully well with uh, everything going on in the church and the context of where we are as a congregation. I mean, the illustrations that I use are plentiful, and I can pick and choose between the emotional ones and the funny ones, and it, 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 everything just works, and it's easy to memorize. I'm so confident that, that it's going to be good that I'll even go on social media and throw, down, throw out some teasers, like, like almost daring people to come and be disappointed. And then Sunday morning comes around, I get up here, and, and it's just kind of flat, like the two-liter bottle that's been opened too many times, and you open, and there's no, psh, it's just nothing. William Williman is a Methodist bishop, and he says, you know, some sermons are like that. It's like an old dog that just rolled over and played dead, and no matter how much you tickle its belly, you can't coax it up to to do anything else. I, sometimes I just feel that way. I, I look out at your faces and, and I recognize that it's not connecting. And then maybe somebody coughs or checks their watch or yawns. And then I get really nervous. And I start sweating under my collar. And I start talking faster. And I know my mom is watching because she watches all of the videos. And that sets her blood pressure rising <laughs> when I talk faster. Can't explain it. I just am thankful that the 20 minutes are over and I go sit down. And those are the ones you see that I think are good. <laughs> but then other times it's the opposite. I sit down on Monday, I look at the text, and I think, oh, that text? Again? <laughs> nothing. Like nothing. Tuesday, I'm shuffling papers around on the desk, no inspiration. I Google some more, get another book off the shelf. By Thursday, when something's got to happen, sermon writing feels like you're in the airplane and you're cramming that suitcase into the overhand compartment of the airplane. It doesn't really fit. I get done squeezing out a few words on the paper. I read through it and looks like a house of cards, like it's been MacGyvered together with duct tape and sewing thread. Like if you remove one word, it's all going to fall apart. I mean, the theology doesn't seem really that tight. I imagine all the ways people would pick it apart. 
It's hard to memorize that sermon. Sunday morning, I'm, you're really nervous and throughout the sermon just hoping that I don't blow it and it doesn't cave in on itself. And then I go and sit down, happy that it's over. But on those Sundays, almost invariably, when I stand out and people walk out, it's the same thing. More than a few people will say, that was a great sermon. That was one of your best ever. I really needed to hear that today. And someone will even say, uh, invariably again, someone will say, Michael, that was great. I loved it when you said such and such. And I didn't even say that. (laughs) (laughs) Now, John Baird, I know you're thinking it's you, but it's not you. (laughs) I'm serious, John. We had a great conversation yesterday. I was going to say this independently of that conversation. But the point is, you see, the point is that um, what was said and what was heard and how it was heard was exactly what needed to be heard. And, and I'm always humbled. I'm humbled by the ways that God can knock me down a few pegs when I'm feeling arrogant or self-righteous. And I'm also humbled and amazed at how God graces me in those situations where Grace is something that we experience where God takes what we don't expect to be much and actually uses that to be something that serves a special purpose. And that's what we see in the first of our two scripture readings today. God taking what we don't expect to be much and and using it for a special purpose. This is the prophet Isaiah. We're reading from chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. And Isaiah is a prophet who lived about 750 years before the time of Jesus. And he has a vision, and this is his vision, Isaiah. In the year that King Uzziah died, I, Isaiah, saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the entire temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him, Each had six wings. With two, they covered their eyes. With two, they covered their feet. And with two, they flew. And one called to another and sang, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the pivots on the threshold shook at the voices of those who called and sang. And the house was filled with smoke. And I, Isaiah, said, Woe is me, for I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people with unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. And the seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has has departed and your sin has been blotted out. And then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, here am I, send me. So Isaiah has a vision. And we try to do justice to this vision. David did a great job in the fourth verse of Holy, 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 which is where this, this, that hymn comes from. And he pulls out all the stops And David Bottom plays the descant, and we try to generate that kind of power because that's what's happening in this vision. Isaiah is in the temple, and he is standing in the presence of God. And what he sees is that the whole entire building is filled with just the bottommost part of God's robe. Now, we have the perfect sanctuary, the perfect sanctuary to imagine this. Look up. Look at how big this sanctuary is. And imagine that we were standing at the feet of somebody who was so big that just the hem of the robe, the bottom part of the garment, filled this entire place. That's what he sees. And there's fire burning on the altar. And there's smoke everywhere. And there's strange six-winged creatures called seraphs flying around and singing holy, holy, holy so loudly that the walls are shaking and the floor is shaking. And in the midst of that, that awesomeness, Isaiah says, I don't deserve to be here. 
I am unworthy. I, I'm like you. I'm, I'm me. I, I'm a human being. I'm faulted and broken and flawed. I don't deserve this. When I read uh, Isaiah 6, 1 to 8 and try to put myself in that context, a part of me thinks of the Wizard of Oz. There's that scene toward the end of the Wizard of Oz where the Dorothy and the Scarecrow and the Cowardly Lion and the Tin Man, they stand before the great and powerful Oz and their knees are shaking and their teeth are chattering and the great and powerful Oz with fire that uh, shoots out from the sides of this face that's superimposed on this curtain says, Silence! How dare you come before the great and powerful Oz? You're not worthy to be here. And he promptly kicks them out, right? Kicks them out of the Emerald City. And we might think that God would do the same thing. I mean, after all, Isaiah says, I'm not worthy to be here. But not only does God not kick Isaiah out of the temple, God draws him closer and says, I need you. I need you to go and serve me. See, conventional wisdom might think that God is put off by that unworthiness. But God rather sees the willingness of Isaiah to go, sees in him willingness, and works with that willingness to use Isaiah to be one of the major, major prophets in the history of God's people. We see in our New Testament reading Jesus identifying that same willingness and recognizing that same willingness in the character of Levi. Levi is one of the disciples of Jesus, the son of Alphaeus. And listen to how Levi becomes part of Jesus' inner circle. This is the Gospel of Mark, chapter 2, verses 13 through 18. Jesus went out again beside the sea, and the whole crowd gathered around him, and he taught them. And as Jesus was walking along, he saw Levi sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me, and Levi got up and followed him. And as he sat at dinner, Jesus sat at dinner in Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were also sitting with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. But when the scribes of the Pharisees saw that he was eating with tax collectors and sinners, they said to his disciples, why is he eating with sinners and tax collectors? But when Jesus heard this, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have come not to call the righteous, but the sinners. So Levi, as um, Hannah shared with us earlier, is a tax collector. And we've mentioned this before. Hannah did a good job of, of articulating this. But tax collectors routinely marked up the taxes they collected. They were supposed to collect this much, but they told the people they needed to collect this much and they pocketed the excess. Everybody knew that this kind of extortion was taking place. They were generally powerless to stop it. But that's why tax collectors in the Gospels are lumped in with sinners as the people that are most disgraceful to God. But Jesus, though, walking along and sees Levi sitting in the tax booth there doing his job, and Jesus gives him the same invitation that he gives to the heroic disciples, Simon, Andrew, James, and John. Same thing. Come, come, follow me. And Levi got up. That's telling there, right? Levi got up and followed him. And then Jesus promptly goes to Levi's house and sits down elbow to elbow at Levi's table and shares a meal with him. Now, it helps to set the scene a little bit. The house is crowded there's lots of people eating there with Jesus and the disciples. And so people, we can imagine, are tucked in every corner of the house and every hallway like your families do when you've got to feed everybody at Thanksgiving and the dining ta room table only holds X number of spots. People sit where they can, finding room where they can. The doors and the window of the house are, are open, which would have been common. That allows passers-by to look inside and, and hear what's going on. And when the Pharisees come by, they don't like what they see and hear. The Pharisees are thought of as the rule protectors. 
the ones who are making sure that people are following the rules of God and living within the parameters of the laws that God gave to the people, the Mosaic law. There were strict laws against eating with known sinners, sharing food, because you see, to share a meal, the expression, we use the expression breaking bread, uh, the expression in the day would have been sharing salt, sharing salt. And when you shared salt with somebody, it was more than just eating from the same plate. It was a way of pledging your loyalty and your commitment and your solidarity with this person that sat at the table with you. And, and so the Pharisees are saying, why would Jesus accept the loyalty of a known sinner? And why would he pledge his loyalty in return? This wasn't what anybody expected. And from Roman times, from Roman times, this time that precedes Jesus even, all the way in Europe through the Middle Ages, what you ate at a party, where you sat, and with whom you sat, all were indicators of your value in society. So for example, you're planning a wedding for your daughter, granddaughter, and you send out the, uh, the, the RSVPs and you ask, will you eat beef, chicken, or veggie? Right? Something like that. But you send that same invitation to everybody, right? Everybody gets the equal choice of beef, chicken, or veggie. Well, it would not be uncommon in the ancient world to have the guest of honor sitting in one place eating special food like filet mignon, while the less important guests on the guest list were sitting far away at the card table, not at the walnut table, the card table, and eating hot dogs or beef jerky. Okay, for an example. Well, you see that that's to say that Levi, it's not as though Levi in his own house is tucked in some back corner eating peanut butter and crackers off a TV tray. No, he's sitting next to Jesus at the main table eating off the fine china, the best of the very best. I'm sure that somebody in the sanctuary today remembers the TV show The Love Boat. Anybody remember The Love Boat? Did you ever raise your hand if you watched The Love Boat? Well, in The Love Boat, so this is show in the 70s and 80s, and invariably on The Love Boat, which is the cruise ship, there's one scene in every episode in the dining room. And at, in the dining room, in the center of the dining room, a few lucky guests every episode were handpicked by Captain Steubing right, to sit there with hi, him and his daughter, Vicky, in front of everybody for the envy of everybody to see. Right? Every episode, it was so important that that dinner scene was in every single episode. Well, that's, that's what's happening here. Levi is given the position of honor, eating the food of honor with the honored guest. And the Pharisees are, are confused. Nobody's expecting that this would be the case. But you see, where everybody else saw a sinner unworthy of entrance into the kingdom of God, Jesus saw willingness. Willingness. Willingness to follow. Willingness to change course to change behavior, to change direction. And Jesus said, I can work with that. I want that guy on my team. And he was. And I think there's a lesson in that for all of us. That God can work with all of us. God can work with preachers and prophets and publicans like Levi. God wants to work with us. And the question is not, are we worthy to be with God? That's never the question. The question, are we willing to go, to go with God? Levi was not worthy of that special attention. Isaiah was not worthy of that special vision. But they were willing, and that willingness mattered. It mattered a lot. I think the same is true for us in our lives. That none of us on our own, due to our genetics or our address, 
is worthy of something like happiness in life or emotional stability or relational health and strong families and strong churches and communities. But if we're willing to do the work that those things entail, we just might discover by God's grace some amazing things that God sees for us even though they're as yet not visible to us. I think that's true for our individual lives, for our family lives, for our church life. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for being someone who identifies willingness, not only identifies it, but values it. Help us to consider the value of willingness and not worthiness. Amen.